It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. I'm back. We're going to talk about the best version of Windows, one you probably can't get a hold of. <laughs> we'll also talk about URL ping tracking, a little backtracking from Steve. And then the continuation of the WinRAR nightmare. It's all next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 710, recorded Tuesday, April 16th, 2019. Dragon Blood. Security Now is brought to you by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Wasabi offers next-generation cloud storage with the highest possible durability and security. See for yourself with free unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click free trial, but use the offer code security now, please. And by IT Pro TV, providing effective training with access to virtual labs and practice tests. Visit go.itpro.tv slash security now to take advantage of their lowest prices of the season. For an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription, don't forget to use the code SN30 at checkout. And by WordPress. Turn your dreams into reality and launch your website at wordpress.com. Get 15% off any new plan at wordpress.com slash security now. It's time for security now, ladies and gentlemen. I give you Steve Gibson, our Welcome. man of the hour. Welcome back from the sunny uh, equatorial Hawaii. Oh, yes. man. I just, I, it's so nice there. 80 <laughs> degrees every day. If it rained, it would rain for a few minutes torrentially. And then a the little sun humid for out. me. I've, I've never been a big fan of humidity. I, I, I need evaporative cooling in order to survive. <laughs> and there, I, there's a lack of there's a lack of that. I, am, I the, embrace uh, it. Remember, you're wearing shorts and uh, Hawaiian shirts. You're not you're not fully dressed at any given time. OK, that's true. <laughs> so, so did anything happen while I was gone? Oh, my goodness. In fact, uh, one of our stories, uh, I'm going to. Uh, that it was the top. It was the topic of last week's podcast was URL ping tracking, because it turns out that there's an attribute in the good old a ref HTML a ref, which you know, w which are the you know the hyperlink click on it that explicitly pings one or more servers when you click on the link, and. The, the, I, it, it was brought to the forefront because the next two versions of Chrome will be removing the ability to disable it. Now, it really doesn't matter because it's enabled by default. And so nobody, you know, as I, you know, I, I love the term, the tyranny of the default, because as we know, default is what everyone runs on unless some so, something cataclysmic happens or they're listening to, the, to this podcast. But uh, so... Uh, that was the topic last week, and so our first topic is the – it turns out I was a little short in my imagination because I said that the only purpose it could possibly have was for tracking. Well, it turns out we have a malicious use of ping tracking <sighs> in URLs has appeared. We've got more on WinRAR that just is the <laughs> vulnerability that just keeps on giving – uh, more third-party AV troubles last week with Patch Tuesday with a, a third-party AV and, of course, Microsoft uh, Windows. We've got um, other new trouble from last week's Patch Tuesday. We also have good things that Patch Tuesday accomplished, both with Microsoft and also with Adobe, who did a Patch Tuesday. Uh, we've got Another security tightening change being proposed by Google. We've got Russia's Roskomnadzor. <laughs> Finally, draw, lowering the boom, Leo, on Facebook. Uh, and the incredible Taj Mahal APT, uh, Advanced Pers Persistent Threat Framework, that Kaspersky has uncovered. Uh, we'll then touch on a bit of miscellany answer a spin right upgrade question, share some closing-the-loop feedback from our listeners, and then we take a look at this 
week's topic, which is dragon blood. That was the 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 name given to the first effective suite of attacks on the forthcoming WPA3 protocol, which we've we've looked at briefly. We'd, we we'd like and our listeners may remember that when I heard about it, I was all excited and I went over to the Wi-Fi Alliance and it looked like they were like they changed their stripes and they were making the specs available. And so I was going to roll up my sleeves and, and have some fun spec reading. And when I clicked on the links, it was, you know, like the table of contents was all you got, which was like the worst kind of tease because it's like, oh, here's all the things we're not going to tell you about the WPA3 protocol because you have to be a member and pay dues and then be in the cloistered community. And of course, at the time I commented on what a mistake it was and what a mistake they continue making by attempting to develop a specification that is as crucial to the health of the of everything of the world's networking as our Wi-Fi protocol, which they they insist on keeping closed. And in fact, what's interesting is that these academic researchers, who, by the way, were the people that designed or found the the K R A C K, the crack uh, breach in W P A two, so they know their way around Wi Fi. Um, they comment several times in their sixteen page uh, research paper about how this could have all been avoided across the board if this had, if this WPA3 development had been done in the open as it should have been rather than behind closed doors. So anyway, uh, I think another great podcast for our listeners as we uh, – uh, it's funny because Elaine also corrected me. I misspoke about a couple weeks ago, I guess, about where we were in the history of the podcast. She said, Steve, uh, just to correct – in four <laughs> months, you'll be ending year fourteen. Yes. So yes. I think I I keep forgetting that I'm as old as I <laughs> as I am. This is uh, we just had the fourteenth anniversary of uh, Twit. Was yep. I think this past weekend, April fifteenth, so yesterday. Uh, and of course, I neglected to say a word because <laughs> I don't really pay attention to that kind of stuff. <laughs> been doing it a long time, you and me, Mister G. Indeed. But we shall do it for. Several hundred more. Two, yes. 289, to be precise. That ought to do it. <laughs> and then by, everything by will then, be patched. <laughs> we, yes, we will have solved the world's security problems. And it'll just be like, okay, did anything happen, Leo? No. Okay. I, I did the Thanks. math at one point. I think it's uh, September 2024. We're here at least, Steve has promised, at least through then. If we can convince him to move to hexadecimal numbering, maybe even longer. So we'll have the second term of our next president, or maybe the first wow. term of wow. the next president. Wow. It would be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another election. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> they just keep coming. Our show today brought to you by Wasabi. You might say another, what? Another hot cloud storage. They just keep coming. Oh, but this is the best yet. Wasabi is truly awesome. And it's because it's from two of my favorite people in the world, David Friend and Jeff Flowers, the founders of uh, Carbonite. They actually patented a novel way of writing data to the hard drive. It's what made Carbonite happen. Uh, they, they, it writes it in, uh, in sequential uh, uh, bits instead of in blocks. And it turns out by doing so, they can make hard drive writes much more efficient uh, and much faster. That's what made Carbonite. And then they thought, you know, basically we are customers of our own hot cloud storage. I bet you there'd be other people interested in this. And Wasabi was born. Next generation cloud storage with the highest possible durability and security and a price that will knock your socks off. Wasabi provides 11 nines of durability. You don't get, there are, there is, there are no 12 nines. It goes to 11 I guess you could say 12, but you can't measure 12. So let's say 11 nines is, is perfect. On average, that's about one file every 649,000 years. It is 
of course, more secure than almost all on-premises storage. And I say that to the people listening to security now. You guys know, as we hear over and over again, I just read a story about how uh, Mondelez, the candy and food manufacturer, got hit in 2017 by Petya, and they watched all their systems go down. It took them weeks and $100 million because, what, they didn't have good backups? They lost everything. $100 million. That's why people are moving to the cloud. It can be more secure. It can be more reliable. Wasabi's hosted in premier tier four data center facilities that are highly secure, fully redundant, but they even go another step farther because you can make any bit of data you want on Wasabi immutable. That means it cannot be erased. It cannot be altered. Malware cannot affect it. And that is a really important feature. It protects you from hackers, protects you from ransomware, protects you from you and your fumble-fingered employees. And actually, really, if you came down to it statistically, it is probably user error that's the most common reason data gets destroyed. But if it's immutable, nothing can touch it. It's HIPAA compliant, FINRA, CJIS compliant. That'll give you some idea of how secure this is. You get active integrity checking. Everything stored on the Wasabi Cloud is checked for integrity every 90 days. And the pricing is amazing. Because of this sequential rights, storage on Wasabi is 80% cheaper and six times faster than the industry leader, which I guess I can tell you is Amazon, right? Uses the S3 API, though. So you already know how to use it. So faster, cheaper, more reliable. They don't even charge for egress. You know, one flat rate. So in every respect, this is a superior solution. Now, I understand... You know, the safe thing to do would be buy one of the big names. I just want you to add a fourth name to your list. You've, I know you got Amazon, Microsoft, and Google on there. But please, do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. Check out Wasabi. In fact, right now, because you're listening, we can set this up for you. One, min one month of unlimited storage. You can load it up. You can load it up. They have to, actually this Wasabi ball. They took this idea from uh, Carbonite as well. Um, if you have a lot of data, like petabytes of data, you're not going to wait for that to upload. So you, they send you the Wasabi ball, you put it on that, you send it back to them, and you're good to go. Experience Wasabi for yourself. Free unlimited storage for a month at wasabi.com. Click the free trial link. And the reason we set this up for you is so that you would do us a favor and put the word security now in there as the code. One word, security now. That way they know you hear it here, and it helps us. And we thank them for their support of security now. Migrate your data to the cloud. Don't get bit by ransomware or fumble-fingered employees. Wasabi.com. Just got just to gotta try it. Just take a look. All right? Don't forget the code security now. And we thank Wasabi so much for their support of Steve and his efforts to keep us all safer for a few minutes longer. <laughs> sometimes it feels like that just hold just on just get me so, to the weekend steve yeah so uh, we did i had two pictures this week because i had mentioned to our listeners uh, maybe a month ago or some time ago that i'd run across uh maybe it was listening to paul and mary joe that a comment that the Windows 10 long-term service channel um, does not come with all of the preloaded crap that you get with the normal consumer Windows 10. But not even the consumer, and, the business Windows 10. Well, the like professional, if, yeah, Windows the 10 pro, professional. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so the first picture here, so what I did was I... I, because I have access as a an MSDN developer, for which I pay Microsoft, you know, hundreds of dollars a year to have access to the, all the versions of everything for software testing, um, I thought, okay, I got to give this long-term service channel deal a try. So I, I took a, a empty laptop, brand new SSD, and first I installed. <laughs> a clean install of Windows 10 Professional. Not even home. This is the pro version. This is the pro. I mean, and I put professional in quotes <laughs> in my title because I've never, I mean, this is what I've been complaining about. If they had named it Windows 10 Arcade version, <laughs> 
then th- I would have no problem I know, with I it. I don't get this either. You know, yeah. we got sausages and hamburgers, yeah. and we've got some guy pruning some hedges with yeah. his clippers, yeah. and we got— Because the I, pros I, like, love solitaire. Everyone knows. <laughs> And I got to play over Candy in, Crush. O- over in the menu, we got two different Candy Crushes. We got <laughs> Candy Crush Friends and Candy Crush Saga. Yeah, and, and Cooking it's, Fever. It's, it's un-effing believable. I have a PowerShell is- script I run first thing before I even open that menu to delete uh, all that crap. It's terrible. Uh, I agree. It's, it's just it's ridiculous. unbelievable. And so then I thought, okay. I, so and I, I mean, here I am. Why, I, why do I have a screenshot? I hit print, print. I put hit print, hit print screen twice, and then wipe and then the drive. I used, <laughs> and I, and I used, you know, 3D print, which was whatever that is, installed, you know, automatically. And but I, but I, uh, then I pasted the screen and saved it off, off to a to an attached drive, wiped the hard drive, and then I, I used an ISO of LTSC, the Windows 10. Long-term service channel. That is the second picture in this week's show notes. And it's just, I mean, it should be called, oh, I mean, it's. Now, how or, do you get this besides MSDN? Or it's got to be called NCSC. What's that? The no crap service <laughs> channel. It's, and I mean, look at it. It's empty. And look at the menu. The, okay, so there's a D for Dell because I was doing this on a Dell laptop. There's nothing else. I mean, just under W are the various Windows this is things. Nice. This is clean. This is the it way is, you want it. It never had – and there's no Cortana. There's yeah. not, that doesn't even have Edge. There's yeah. no media crap. I use the N version, which is the European version because, of course, they're more upset with Microsoft about, about um, – uh, installing things that they feel is is too strong. So I mean, it's just there's there never was anything there. So um, it is the case that consumers cannot get this. This uh, is an enterprise um, build. So this is available to enterprises. It it and and the point is that it doesn't do that. This constant feature updating and. It, although it is constantly re-released with, you know, the updated set of features, um, and each release has a ten-year commitment from Microsoft for for being being kept up to date from a security standpoint. So, what, what um, the best thing Microsoft could do would be to give regular people the option. To have this, there's no reason. I mean, if well, they I, did for a while do the Windows 10 Signature Edition, and they tried think, to talk do Net, OEMs. Do you think Netflix is paying them to? I mean, yes. I'm looking at of course Netflix it is. here of course on it the is. screen. These, these people aren't there for free; they're all paying for it. Oh, and, and then all these and the teasing. OEM adds more, right? That's when the OEM yeah. puts McAfee and, and or Symantec on there and all that other crap. And, and well, and then and then you have all these teasy versions of stuff. You have these stubs where it's like the first time you click on something is like, oh, you're interested in this. Hold on a second, we'll yeah. download that because they're not really you. installed. They're just you know picture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in fact, when you if you click if you open the start menu, the instant it boots, you, well, what comes up are a whole bunch of blank tiles with download arrows because oh. because <laughs> even the ISO cannot hold all of this crap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it won't fit on one on on one disc I have to admit, anywhere. This, this looks good. I want this. Oh. Uh, this is the menu. The only thing I note is there. It doesn't seem to be a browser. How are you supposed to put Chrome on there, or Firefox? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess you'd have to. You know, you're a network the, uh, the, 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 IT the network guy. Ins- yeah. yeah, get the network install version, yeah. and then stick it on a thumb drive in order to bring it over. But I mean, it's just it's just a breath of fresh air. I know. It's just like, OK, now, you know, although I'm still really happy with seven, I am NTSC man here on out. I mean, I'll I'll pay my I'll pay my MSDN dues in order to have access to this thing, because it is just like, oh, look at it. Yeah. It's just wonderful. So, I mean, I can duplicate pretty much this, but I have to run a bunch of scripts and I have a bunch of tools and. And uh, I do notice that that if you uh, delete those big tiles in the start menu, your start menu slims down. It doesn't stay open that wide. It looks, Correct. you know, it looks like this. So you know, you can get it close to this. 
But it would be nice and, to have a version. And, yes. And until now, that's what I've been doing. Yeah. I first of all go through. I mean, I, 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 yeah. Yes. I, I also run a couple PowerShell scripts to like remove all of right. that junk. Right. Um, and, and then you go through and just delete, delete, delete. It takes like, you know, an hour or two in order to prune a system to where it's like, okay, this is, you know, what I wish I had been given. But, oh, anyway, I just wanted to make, I wanted to, to plant this idea somewhere that, you know, there is a, there are a bunch of people who would like to own, who would like to, to have this LTSC. And I guess the problem is no one's buying Windows 10 anymore. You know, it's, yeah, they give it, you know, away, it, it comes, right? it comes pre-installed on yeah. anything that you get. Right. And so, because no one has to pay for it because of all the jumping tiles exactly. that you have to tolerate. Yeah. 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 I know what you okay. mean. I just got my uh, ThinkPad uh, Extreme, which I love, my X1 Extreme. It's an amazing laptop. Love it. But, of course, the first thing you have to do is decrapify it. And then I got your great uh, terabyte software uh, image for Windows. Nice. And I love that. And immediately image I, it. They Fortunately, yep. Microsoft does put a recovery image on the hard drive anyway. So it takes that, makes a recovery USB key, makes it very easy. Um, and now I can get back to the... <laughs> I, ba I basically built my own LTSC. <laughs> yeah. Because you pay, it's like 800 bucks a year for uh, MSDN. Yes, it's not, that's what it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I mean, so it's not nothing, but, you know, it, it does, uh, it, well, in my, for me, it pays for itself because I have access to uh, whatever I need when I'm, when I'm testing uh, uh, software on various platforms. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, so um, I need to start right out, as I said before, acknowledging a failure of my imagination. <laughs> Our listeners will recall that last week's podcast, as I mentioned at the top, was URL ping tracking, where I described the HTML5 feature of the ping term, which can be added into an, the A, you know, A space href equals anchor tag in, in order to cause the browser to asynchronously uh, send a ping post to anywhere. And I, and I commented at the time that, oh, and, and Leo, you did miss some fun stuff because I, I looked at the source of a Google search page from Chrome you know, right click and then mm -hmm. on, on and view source and the URLs were clean because in every one of the URLs was a ping reference because in order for Google to track which link I clicked. And and I and I acknowledge that there are, you know, there are reasons why Google would need to know what we clicked on uh, other than for just tracking us and profiling us and building up a profile of us for their advertising business. And that is uh, it helps their search results. If they know, if they present a bunch of, of URLs and they see what people tend to choose from a page that, that a human has never looked at before, now a human is looking at it. So, so, th so th th there's, there's some value there. If you bring up the same page under, for example, Firefox, what the what you see is that the URLs do not point to where the link is taking you, but they all, of course, point back to Google. And in the URL tail is the actual destination. So when, when you click on the link, you go back to Google. Google registers that, sees where you're actually wanting to go, and then redirects your browser there. So the point is, you know, the... the Without this ping tracking, we're using URL redirection in order to achieve the same thing. Um, and, and I got some feedback from my listeners who were, from, who were disappointed last week in my, my kind of resignation to the fact of tracking. It's like I, I said, you know, well, the, the browsers are going to end up giving up on this. We are going to have de facto ping tracking because it's now in the HTML5 spec. Chrome is removing it from even the ability to disable it. Uh, I had I did learn 
that um, you block origin automatically blocks it. So there's another little benefit of using you block origin. I mean, it comes for free. It just blocks the ping tracking. Um, anyway, so back to my failure of imagination. Uh, it, it turns out that uh, the sole purpose of the ping term is not only tracking. Uh, it has been used as an effective DDoS attack. Um, it turns out that um, it allows JavaScript to edit the ping term and to then programmatically click the URL to launch these ping queries at any other website. One of the things that I noted last week is that there is no same origin protection for this ping. That is, it can you can ping anywhere, not just the origin from which the page came. And I talked about how, you know, on, I, I first blushed, that was like, wait a minute, you know, uh, is that good? Except that I'm sure that the, the people who are working on the spec noted that, well, the URL could go anywhere. So URL redirection has no same origin restrictions. So why should ping tracking? Well, one of the consequences of no same origin enforcement for the ping is that if it, that, that and it's already been done in the wild, that these pings can be aimed at, an, at a site that you wish to attack and JavaScript is able to trigger the URLs, which then triggers an off-site ping. Um, what happened was that uh, Imperva Research uncovered a DDoS attack utilizing these HTML pings to perform a distributed denial of service attack on various gaming websites. In one attack which they monitored, which peaked at 7,500 requests per second, a total of 70 million requests were generated from approximately 4,000 IP addresses over the course of four hours, which substantially loaded, you know, basically buried the, the targeted server under relatively expensive requests. I mean, they are, they're, they're short queries, but in terms of, in terms of an HTML request, that's more than, you know, 7,500 per second is more than, than most, um, uh, sites are equipped to handle. Um, as we know, Safari and Opera, we would cover this last week, no, offer no provision for disabling this behavior. Uh, it's enabled by default in Chrome, and Google has is planning to the 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 I think it's we're on 73 now with Chrome, 74 and 75 have removed the option to disable it. It is still disabled by default under Firefox and Brave. Firefox offers you the option to enable it. Brave doesn't even offer you the option to enable it. So good on them. Um, but it does look like, um, as a consequence of this kind of abuse, that our browser designers are going to need to come up with some way to preserve this functionality, which they've pretty much all capitulated to. I, I, I also mentioned last week that th this ping term, it was familiar to me when I saw, the, when I saw the, that Chrome was removing it, which is what put it back on our radar for last week. Um, it's been around for a decade, but it's sort of like no one was in a hurry to do it because it was just pure and simple tracking. I mean, that's what it was for, was for, mo for link auditing is where it's euphemistically described in some places. So I think what they're going to need to do is to come up with some way to prevent its abuse. Um, uh, uh, maybe prevent script from modifying it in the DOM. Um, I, I, I don't know what they'll do. Or maybe reconsider not uh, putting a same origin policy limit on it as so many other things in our browsers currently have. Uh, and that same, we often talk about the same origin limitation being hugely responsible for security. If, if you could only ping back to the site which had issued the page, then 
then you can make it that site's responsibility to ping other people if it chose to do so. The, and, and just for the record, Leo, because this is, I mean, the, the coolness of this is that, and I'm sure it's part of the reason that Google likes it, is that it it is a, it's an asynchronous query. That is, if you use the, if you use the old style URL redirection approach, then you, when you click on a link, you go back to the site that issued the page and then first, and then it redirects you to your target. If you use the ping approach, the browser does both at once. It, the, the URL you're clicking on is your target. So you go directly to that page while in the background, um, the, the browser launches a separate thread, which ping, which follows the, the ping reference in the URL yeah, you, to notify the site. You wouldn't want it to hang things up while I did all that. That would right. be, yeah. Right, right. And so, so it, but so it, if you were to impose a, a, um, a same origin policy, then you could still get the speed increase of a synchronous operation then the that but the site that that was pinged back to could if it chose issue ping its own pings to other third parties rather than having it done by the user's browser so it's actually a little cleaner too it'd be nice to see that maybe uh people will say oh whoops uh we need to you know just impose a same origin policy i mean it probably takes half a line of code to do that because all of the logic is already in our browsers for taking care of this. WinRAR. Oh, uh, we, we've been, I know we've been talking about it every single week since it happened. Uh, Sophos's naked security, uh, the, the title of, of their report from yesterday said an ancient what WinRAR vulnerability made public in February is now well on its way to becoming one of the most widely and rapidly exploited security flaws of recent times. That's what's happened. And the reason is, as we've discussed before, there, there are so many copies of this out in the world now, half a billion copies, and there wasn't an upgrade mechanism. And again, I'm not faulting the WinRAR guys, um, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, Leo, but I did get email from them. Um, I think it may have been last week, so you wouldn't have heard this. But because I'm a registered user and have supported them also, because it, it has been my my favorite tool. Although I did hear Paul say that he likes Seven Zip now. Yeah, as, I've been as using the, Seven Zip too. I haven't used WinRAR in a long time. Yeah. yeah. And, and anyway, a lot of people have it, and that's why it's being exploited so widely. Um, so uh, their coverage from yesterday uh, was titled Flood of Exploits Targeting Ancient WinRAR Flaw Continues. Uh, the latest evidence is a report from Microsoft's Office 365 threat research team, which identified it as, as being used by the Muddy Water oh, – <laughs> there's boy. a name for you the, – the Muddy Water – advanced persistent threat group <laughs> to target or uh, muddies the water uh, to target organizations in the satellite and communications industry. Uh, and it turns out, as we've said, WinRAR was far too tempting for cyber criminals to ignore. Mm. Uh, and within days of stirring up a hornet's nest of exploits to the tune of 100 exploits or more, so Microsoft's blog about recent targeted attacks serves as yet another warning to organizations or individuals. If anybody's listening to this still hasn't done it, I don't know why, but if maybe you missed a few podcasts like, you know, since February, um, if you haven't updated or removed WinRAR yet, you really do need to do that. Um, we need to get word we need word to get around as much as possible since, as we've noted previously, unregistered users or users who no longer maintain their registered email accounts. That is, you know, you may have registered it 10 years ago and then w with an email account you no longer have. So they so the WinRAR guys who did send out a notification to all the email that they had, you may not have received it because 
that was so long ago. Um, so I'm glad that Microsoft has done this because, again, the more attention this gets, the more people will will have the opportunity to fix this. Otherwise, it's just going to sit there and and be a, a a means for bad stuff to get into people's systems. Um, Microsoft detected the threat to their Office 365 um, early last month in March. The APT attackers used a word attachment claiming to be from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Oh boy. So I'm not sure who they're targeting. I don't know if I were to receive that email. It's like, eh, I don't think so. But opening it triggers a download from a OneDrive link, which has since been shut down, which uh, downloads an archive containing a second word file within which is embedded a macro which initiates the payload in the form of a PowerShell script, which opens a command backdoor, allowing the attackers to deliver the malicious ACE file, which contains the exploit. That is known as a chain <laughs> because there's so many steps in, or so many links in the chain, so many steps involved. So uh, it's a bit convoluted because the attackers need to induce the user via a bogus warning dialog. Apparently they're in a hurry to get the system restarted. So they show a warning dialog insisting that the user needs to restart their PC. And as we know, the, the ACE exploit causes something to be put in the user's startup folder. So it doesn't actually get invoked until they do restart their PC. Um, so, as has been noted in the coverage of this, while the entire exploit chain will not succeed every time, um, it's a numbers game targeting multiple individuals inside a specific organization. Thanks to you know the nature of the this you know this is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. So yeah, not aimed at everybody. Um, Sophos said, no one should assume that just because the attacks detected so far have been connected to nation state actors, that this will always be the case. Commercial exploits won't be far behind. And they said WinRAR's half a billion reported users is a lot of victims to aim at. So just again, <laughs> another reminder. Um, so uh, it turns out that there were a bunch of problems caused by last Tuesday's patch update, uh, you know, patch Tuesday update. Um, it resulted in relatively widespread problems for users of a number of major third-party AV systems. Uh, as, as we noted before be, we began recording, I think we were talking about this, Leo, the, the widespread problems were predominantly caused, although there were some Windows 10, uh, there were there were problems under Windows 7, 8.1, Windows Server 2012, and Server 2012 R2, which were causing these systems to freeze, be unable to boot, or to hang on installing updates. And it also appears that some Win 10 users were also affected, um, according to support articles from Microsoft, Avast, Avira and Sophos, there is a conflict between some of the recent updates and uh, AV software, including Sophos's endpoint protection, uh, Arca bit, AVG business edition, Avira antivirus, and Avast for business and cloud care. Uh, in the case of Sophos, in their support in their support article, they state that the updates could cause Windows to fail to boot. Reports from users also indicate that the update process may hang at the configuring updates stage. Um, everybody involved is aware of the problems, and at least in the case of Sophos, Microsoft has has written quote to prevent further issues. Microsoft has placed a block on the conflicting updates 
so that they are not offered to users running Sophos Endpoint until a solution is made available. Um, I have details in the show notes, but basically it's um, all of the updates from April 9th, uh, both the security only update and the monthly the monthly roll up affecting Windows 8.1, Windows 7 Service Pack 1, Windows Server 2012. In every case, both the security only update and the monthly roll up containing that that same update. Avast has looked at the same things and they've identified the updates which are causing problems and they are not the same ones that are causing problems for Sophos. So they had uh, actually several different ones. Uh, Avira has looked at the problems uh, and they and they found that they were having problems uh, both under Windows 10 in their case and under Windows 7. Uh, they suggest uninstalling these Windows updates for now. Um, and then Sophos needed to provide some support for their customers that were getting stuck at the – when Windows fails to start, freezes, or gets stuck at configuring updates, their recommendation is to boot into safe mode, disable Sophos antivirus service from safe mode, reboot into normal mode, uninstall – the, the respective Windows knowledge base updates, re-enable the <laughs> Sophos antivirus service, and then, of course, reboot in order to bring, bring everything back together. And they said, if enabled, tamper protection will need to be disabled to re-enable the service. So, you know, a lot for end users to deal with. On the other hand, you know, I guess this is what, you know, comes with the territory if you want to use a third-party AV now because we have been talking about now an increasing number of problems that third-party AV is having uh, uh, with with um, uh, newer versions of Windows. Also, Gunter Born of Born City reported based on the version of Windows 10 that you had that there were – uh, various updates uh, for 1709, 1803, 1809, and 1903, uh, which were causing problems. So he enumerated those. I have these in the show notes for anyone who's interested. Uh, bleeping Computer, uh, if uh, paraphrasing, paraphrasing from their report, they said, users are reporting that after installing this week's Microsoft April 2019 patch Tuesday updates, the Windows has suddenly become slow and programs are taking forever, unquote, <laughs> to open. They, uh, I think this was Lawrence who wrote that we have received emails and seen reports from users who have stated that this week's updates are also causing Windows to become very slow. The reports have been from users running Windows 10 and Windows 7. The issues that users are experiencing include Windows taking a long time to start or reboot, unable to start programs, a lag in games, excessive disk activity, video streaming issues, and other similar problems. He said, for example, in a comment at Bleeping Computer, a reader has stated that their Windows 10 computer has become extremely slow and that rebooting slash starting Windows takes forever. Users on Reddit, and he had six references, and elsewhere, two references, are also complaining that Windows has become very slow since installing last week's updates. He wrote, Normally, when a user has an antivirus program, Windows Defender will disable its real-time protection. He said, It seems that for this user, at least, Windows Defender is being enabled automatically even though the user had Avira installed on the machine. Having two antivirus programs performing real-time protection, he wrote, could definitely cause slowdowns and other issues. He says, at this time, there's nothing from Microsoft that states they're aware of the reported issues. The only reference to Windows being slow since the, win since the updates is from a support article posted yesterday by Avira. Is it Avira? Avira? Anyway, that is simply titled, Why Does My System Run Very Slow? This article states that if Windows 10 has become slow, you should remove the 509 update. 
for Windows 7 users, they state you should remove the 472 and the 448 updates for Windows 7. He says, as these instructions are for users for their software, it may not apply to everyone. Um, Bleeping Computer has reached out to Microsoft, but has not heard back. Um, two hours after they published that, they updated their article to note that Computer World's Woody Leonard also reported he is seeing users having slowdown issues on Windows 10 after installing these updates. And then two hours after that, um, they also they updated again, saying that Bleeping Computer has been told by a source familiar with the matter that these issues are being caused by conflicts between the recent updates and AV software. In other words, it's not just complete freezing and failure to reboot or hanging, but it may be that the system finally does get going, but then is operating very slowly. So it, it really sounds like, you know, if we step back from this, Microsoft made some changes that caused AV software to, to no longer interact properly with Windows, um, not just older ones, but even with Windows 10. So uh, this needs to get sorted out. Uh, and, you know, just a heads up if any of our users have encountered this uh, in the show notes, I, I pretty much captured everything with which updates can be um, uninstalled in order to, to get systems running again. This point is so, probably be behoove people just to stop using third-party AV, right? Well, yeah, our listeners know that that's how you and I feel. We have talked about Windows Defender, the fact that looking at it, uh, it is now doing an, an at-par version of, I mean, an at-par level of protection. Um, the, when we most recently looked at it, I think I recall that it was finding everything that others were it had a slightly higher false positive defect de detection rate, but I've never had it do a false positive. Um, no, although I, actually, that's, I don't think that's an issue at all. I've never even yeah, seen a it, virus warning ever. <laughs> <laughs> ever. Actually, actually, in it was the last week or the week before, I deobfuscated a URL to something which was uh, in, 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 in the show notes. And uh, I got reports from our listeners that Window Defender was causing, was calling the show notes <laughs> to, to, to like flagging them as dangerous. <laughs> so uh, someone, someone is watching. Windows Defender is watching. And yeah, Leo, I mean, I just, the, the you know, I mean, I understand people develop an affection for the AV that they're using. They have come to rely on it. They have a subscription. They've paid for, you know, a, a year of it. Um, but the, the fact is, we saw this before with third-party firewalls, where to do their job, they had to sink their hooks deep into the OS into the kernel, and it was it was causing problems. Then, famously, uh, with XP, they had a firewall, but it was disabled by default. Uh, but it was there. And then, finally, with Service Pack 2, they enabled it by default. And now, third-party firewalls are kind of like, okay, you know, Windows comes with one. Well, Windows comes with a free, good AV. And we're now seeing, I mean, I, I, I'm not a conspiracy guy, but boy, you know, uh, suddenly there seems to be all of this trouble with third-party AV. Oh, you think, Mike, it's, Windows ain't yeah. done till the AV won't run? Is that it? <laughs> uh -huh. So uh, I think it's, re I mean, in fairness to Microsoft, I, I think it's more likely that these AVs hook so deep into the OS. They they do. They, yes. they hook into the kernel. I mean, that that's the yep. problem, really. Yep. Uh, although you got to wonder, they're not small companies. They're well known names, and there are hundreds of millions of you know Avira users and other users. They Microsoft knows that. You'd think they test with that. But well, and yes, and Microsoft is really, as we know, is releasing these roll-ups 
ahead of time. I mean, I've already got next month's roll up sitting there. I'm not touching it. Lord right. knows. Right. But you know, they have the they have the. Are you on the insider ring? Is that why? They, no, you always get that. You know, an, under optional updates is oh, the preview, okay. uh, is the preview okay. of the next month of of uh, roll up, and so. Since those are causing problems, you would think that the AV guys are like, like trying them and saying, "Whoa, Microsoft!" Ah, or working to fix their problem preemptively before Microsoft is able to roll these things out officially. I mean, you have to be way on the inside to know. But boy, for what it's worth, you know, I've got AV. It's scanning all of my stuff all the time, and it's called Windows Defender. Hmm. And it's not causing Windows any trouble. Mm -hmm. So, and I know you're in the same position. That's so. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Leo, we're at 40 minutes in. Let's take a break and we'll talk about what, since I just talked about what a disaster Patch Tuesday was, <laughs> let's talk about what 74 security flaws yeah. it fixed. Let's talk about why you have to install it anyway. E exactly. That's, that's really what, that's really the bottom line. That's why I hate seeing these problems uh, surface uh, because then, you know, people, especially people who listen not to this show because you know better and you're safer. It's the people listen to the radio show I worry about. Yeah. Um, that's why we need more IT pros. That's why you need to go to IT Pro TV, our sponsor. IT Pro TV is the easy, fun, binge-worthy way of studying so you can get the IT certs to get into IT or keep your job or get a better job in IT. They have they have been just just knocking it out of the park for how many years now? Um, they started with us maybe six years ago, seven years ago. These this is the place to go to get the best comprehensive IT training from real professionals who are still nevertheless engaging, smart, fun to watch. Spring's almost here. There's never been a better time to take advantage of their lowest prices ever. IT Pro TV is, they're blowing it out to the bare walls. A standard membership, video only, is just $28.50 a month. You get all their videos, thousands of hours of on-demand training. You can watch anywhere on your web, uh, you know, on your computer's uh, web browser, of course, but also on the big screen TV because you could use Chromecast or Roku. They have an Amazon Fire TV, an Apple TV app. They have iOS and Android apps. They they are recording constantly. They have five studios now, nine to five, Monday through Friday. They are recording. That means there's new content every day. Your training is always aligned with the latest certifications. No dusty old content. Nope. You get the most current tests, the most current certs. Episodes go from studio to web in a day, in 24 hours. So you are seeing fresh stuff. You can even watch live if you want. It's actually really fun. It's like watching us live. IT Pro TV is CompTIA's official video training partner. Even more reason. On CompTIA, of course, does some of the most important uh, IT certs like the A+, the Network+, and the Security+. Uh, there are 12 CompTIA on-demand courses at IT Pro TV. That's part of your standard membership. You want a premium membership? You get the video, all the video, but you also get labs that work in an HTML5 browser. So you can set up a Windows network and use Windows clients and all this stuff in the lab, but you don't even have to have a Windows machine. You could do it on a, a, a Chromebook, for, for crying out loud. You can do it at the library. You also get practice tests, so you can take the exam before you take the exam. That's nice peace of mind. That is $42 a month. But wait, there's more because neither of those prices include our special offer. And I don't know why, but IT Pro TV, not only did they cut the prices, but they're still honoring the offer. So take 30% off those prices forever. as Not for the first year, but forever, as long as you stay active. That means a standard membership is less than 20 bucks a month, 199 bucks a year. What is what is that kind of advancement worth to you? I guarantee you it's more than 199 bucks a year. More than 20 bucks a month. The premium membership less than 30 bucks a month. $295 a year. Less than a buck a day. I'm sure you spend more than that on your coffee. This is a must. Visit go.itpro.tv/securitynow. Use the code SN30. You'll get 30% off either your standard or your premium membership. By the way, they also have a team portal. 
if you have an IT team and you want to keep them sharp and on their toes and learning because they love it and it's good for you, check with them too. You can get a free demo at the same place. Go.itpro.tv slash security now. And the offer code is SN30. Don't let another season pass you by without earning your IT certs or getting a better job in IT or just impressing everyone with your knowledge. Go.itpro.tv slash security now and use the code SN30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. That's one of the great things about getting older in life is at this point I'm not striving to get a better job or get a new job, but I love learning. So there's plenty of people like me, too, at IT Pro TV, where we're getting challenged and I'm learning, and it helps me with my work. I could tell you that. IT Pro TV, flexible training, binge-worthy content, life-changing results. We're really proud of the success they've achieved in the past few years. From nothing to stars. Back to Steve. So <clears throat> why should I install... Those patches, Steve, given what you've told me. Why? <laughs> we've, Give we've me 74 good reasons. You certainly covered what a disaster. Well, especially two out of 74. Uh, last Tuesday's patch uh, did fix some very important things. It repaired 74 security flaws, including two actively exploited Windows Zero Days. So our listeners may remember that makes it the second month in a row that a pair of actively exploited zero days were patched by patch Tuesday. The, 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 the two zero days in uh, specifically are very similar. Both are elevation of privilege vulnerabilities impacting the win 32 K dot DLL, which actually should seem familiar or sound familiar. Cause that's what it was also last, last month. Uh, which is, of course, one of the core components of the Windows OS kernel. Um, those two problems were discovered and responsibly reported separately by uh, two different security teams, the Alibaba, Alibaba Cloud Intelligence Security Team and Kaspersky Lab, who have been very busy. We'll be hearing more about Kaspersky uh, in a bit. Um, and Microsoft describes the two zero days identically in their coverage. They said, and it's a little bone chilling, an elevation of privilege vulnerability exists in Windows when the Win32K component fails to properly handle objects in memory. An attacker who successfully exploited this vulnerability could run arbitrary code in the kernel. Uh, oh, I, code in kernel mode, which is, you know, even worse. An attacker could then install programs, view, change, or delete data, or create new accounts with full user rights. To exploit this vulnerability, an attacker would first have to log on to the system, and as we know, or be under the user's login. They said an attacker would then run a specially crafted application that could exploit the vulnerability and take control of an affected system. The update addresses this vulnerability by correcting how Win32K handles objects in memory. So, yay <laughs> for that. Um, we have no further uh, details about the, vo the exploitation of the vulnerabilities, which is good because we know that it takes people some time to get these things patched, and this would be something bad guys would love to jump on. Um, so, But we do know that they were found in the field being exploited, so that thus they are zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, and Kaspersky has reported to Microsoft six Windows 32K elevation of privilege zero days in the past six months all of which we found, uh, they found, being exploited by a nation-state affiliated hacking group. So we could safely assume that the one Kaspersky found this time is probably number seven in that particular hit parade. And what this suggests is that somebody somewhere has a bunch of potent zero days, which 
are being found by, in this case, Kaspersky, um, by observing their use in the wild. So, you know, who knows how many more exist that have not yet been found. Um, aside from the Windows Zero days, not surprisingly, among the remaining 72 flaws which were fixed, there were three office access connectivity bugs that can allow attackers to execute code on vulnerable systems, all which can be exploited remotely. Another code execution bug impacts the Windows GDI Plus component when parsing EMF files, and that's a worrisome vulnerability since it can be exploited, remote, exploited merely by convincing users to visit a website or by emailing users a malicious file um, because anything that can cause that the EMF image to be displayed can potentially invoke this flaw in GDI+. So those are bad and those are fixed. So yes, uh, despite all the problems with last week's Patch Tuesday, whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> what does that mean? Little, I've never heard that, that, that one. Is that, that Pebbles? Was, uh, that that <laughs> got... That, that's my you've got mail, which is what a sound file that I got from CompuServe, of oh, all things. Oh, man. So, yes, I have been around for a while. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> by now you surely don't have to know. I turn off mail notifications. First thing I do, you've got mail? That's like a big deal? Don't you get yeah, mail every I three seconds? <laughs> No, no, I only, I, I get no spam, oh, just like so Dvorak. Smart. <laughs> you're so <Just> smart. Like. <laughs> if I had announcements every time I got mail, I'd never get anything done. <laughs> Actually, I just turned off Indiegogo uh, email this morning because I got so tired of oh, them just, I know. they just gone promotion I crazy. Know. And I thought, okay, uh, you know. I have a folder just no for that more. crap. No more. Yeah. Um, okay, so anyway, definitely install the uh, Patch Tuesday updates they're going to fix some things you're going to want fixed. But, you know, beware if you are also using third-party AV that uh, you may, you know, I mean, the good news is before Windows does this every month, they they do a, uh, what is it, a checkpoint, um, uh, system restore point. And right. so you can certainly back out and then go, whoops, I think I'll wait a while until my AV and these most recent updates make peace with each other. And in the meantime, in the interim, just be a little more careful than maybe you would otherwise be. And not to be left behind, Adobe also released 40 patches last Tuesday. Uh, it was a large security update for them covering uh, their Bridge CC, Adobe Experience Manager Forms, InDesign, Adobe XD, Dreamweaver, get this, Shockwave Player, and Adobe Flash Player. Oh, and also Acrobat uh, and Acrobat Reader. Uh, the vulnerabilities fixed include some which can lead to arbitrary code execution, sensitive information disclosure, and remote code execution in the context of the current user. <laughs> when I read that Adobe's Shockwave Player was suffering from a total of seven serious security flaws, all critical memory corruption issues exploitable for the purpose of executing arbitrary code, I thought, Shockwave? You've got to be kidding me. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's around. <laughs> oh, Leo, we're no longer allowed to use Windows 95, Windows 98, NT, 2000, or XP. But someone somewhere is still using Shockwave? That just doesn't seem right. <laughs> so, uh, actually, it turns out when I dug in a little bit deeper, I turns out I spoke too soon. Since these were the last updates that Shockwave will ever receive. So... Uh, Adobe wrote, effective April 9th, 2019, which was last Tuesday, Adobe Shockwave will be discontinued and the Shockwave player for Windows will no longer be available for download. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. 
I know, but I come can't on. I believe you still yes, could. <laughs> last week? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what the? Uh, they said companies with existing enterprise licenses. That's the problem right there. For Adobe Shockwave continue to receive support until the end of their current contract. So no more contract renewals. So enterprises, if I mean, Lord knows, I mean, you're if if you're still using Shockwave, you probably are not within reach of this podcast, unfortunately. But you know, it just had seven remote code execution arbitrary code execution vulnerabilities fixed last week, which suggests there are probably more because shockwave how old is it come on so anyway if somehow i mean it is way time to switch to html5 anything shockwave can do you can do now with javascript and html5 so hire a programmer you know maybe rasmus vind who did the great work with uh with for me with Squirrel and uh, uh, the the Squirrel forums, maybe maybe you can get him to fix your website if you're or your corporate whatever it is if you need Shockwave because boy you really shouldn't. Uh, also, Adobe's F Flash Player had an out of bounds read and a use after free flaw fixed, either of which could result in data leaks or the execution of arbitrary code. Uh, Acrobat and Reader also received a substantial update last Tuesday with a total of 21 security issues resolved, 10 leading to information disclosure, and 11 other bugs that could be exploited to execute arbitrary code, which is to say evil PDFs could be formed, which when viewed with reader would execute code on your system. So uh, if you, you absolutely want to update your Acrobat and reader uh, and be careful about, I mean, mostly you want to be careful about what you click on in email that you receive or in sketchy websites that you visit. I mean, that, you know, the, the, the overall best advice is, is just, exercise caution I know I, I, it's difficult to always do because sometimes we get excited about something that we're being offered but but really be careful um, Google uh, you know uh, I continue to be impressed with some things they do don't impress me uh, famously we know that their their CRL set approach to to dealing with certificate revocation is so badly broken that it's not even worth doing. Um, but they do, they, I mean, they're responsible for many of the improvements that we're seeing on the web. And, and for that, I thank them and salute them. Um, and of course, we talked about the, the changes that they're making to Android in order to uh, improve its security. In this case, uh, Emily Stark with the uh, Chrome branch of Google posted to the World Wide Web Consortium list a, ty a uh, an item titled Blocking High Risk Non Secure Downloads. She wrote, Hi, Web App Sec Friends. So, Web Application Security Friends. She said, Over in Chrome land, we've been considering how to drive down non secure downloads particularly high-risk ones like executables. She, she wrote, I wanted to see if other browsers would be interested in joining us on this adventure. We want to achieve the right balance between compatibility slash user disruption and security improvements. You know, of course, that's always the, the, the challenge is tighten things down, restrict things that have traditionally worked, thus making them not work when they're deemed to be unsafe, yet not cause too much disruption. She said, so we will likely start by treating certain high-risk downloads initiated from secure contexts 
as active mixed content and block them, we're still finalizing our metrics before we can share them publicly. But right now it's looking like it will be feasible to block a set of high risk file types, meaning executables and archives as determined by the content type header or sniffed MIME type. We will likely focus on protecting desktop users because Android and safe browsing already provide protection against malicious APKs. She said, we're not planning to focus on non-secure downloads initiated from non-secure contexts at the moment because users at least see the not secure Omnibox badge on those pages. She says, feedback welcome. Thanks, Emily. Then in a follow-up reply to someone else's query about which types Google was considering, she wrote, we're looking at XEs, DMGs, and CRXs as executables, and zip, gzip, rar, tar, bzip, and uh, slash, et cetera, as archives. In response to a query from ZDNet, a Mozilla spokesperson said, we are interested in exploring these ideas further in conversation with Google and other interested parties. The general idea aligns with the steps we have previously taken to protect users from insecurely delivered content. Okay, so what she said there is key. She said, initiated from secure contexts as active mixed content and block them. So, so the, the idea is that, that right now, if the, the browsers make a distinction between active and passive mixed content. First of all, mixed means from uh, um, content which is fetched, fetched without HTTPS security, so HTTP, from a page who which was delivered over HTTPS. So, um, so for example, passive content are things like, for example, an image. Browsers will typically still allow you to fetch a, an image over HTTP, although some of them complain in, in various subtle ways, but they don't like show it as a broken link and refuse to load it. However, active stuff like, for example, JavaScript will not be tolerated. You cannot lo load JavaScript from an HTTP URL, um, d w which exists in an HTTPS context because that's active mixed context. So what they're, what they're considering doing is that a uh, moving user initiated, and that's the other distinction, clicking on something, for example, you could certainly click on a, on an HTTP URL on an HTTPS page, meaning you, you, you know, a user action to switch contexts from HTTPS to HTTP is always permitted that you can do. But, but what they're talking about now doing is if that HTTP link were to download a, an XE a, or a Mac a DMG or an, an, a, any of a, a bunch of archives from an HTTP URL, Chrome is proposing saying uh, no. Now, maybe it's bypassable. They would bring up a, a, an interstitial and say, hold on, you know, you're, you're asking to download something from a non-secure source. Are you sure you want to proceed? Or maybe they're just going to decide to be more heavy-handed and, and decide there, there is no case for uh, still allowing that to be done. That seems a little, little extreme to me. But it does look like uh, Firefox is interested in following, and you know we're what we're seeing overall is a is an incre a continuous set of incremental moves, moving the entire web over to HTTPS. Uh, of course, we have um, the Let's Encrypt uh, effort, 
which has for the 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 lowest quality of certificate uh, has at least automated those so that there you no longer have the excuse of the entry barrier of needing to to pay money to be secured that we have. So uh, I, I think it'll be maybe an interstitial at first that might help people on sites who are pulling things from HTTP. I mean, maybe it's just laziness. Maybe, if, maybe for example, that domain already supports security and they just didn't put an S on their URLs because they didn't bother to. And if they did, then it would no longer be a mixed content fetch. So we'll see how this shakes out. But again, I, I tip my hat to Google. I think that the, you know they're moving us in the right direction and it's all for the best. So, Leo, I said at the top of the show mm -hmm. that Russia's Roskomnadzor <laughs> is just like saying it. That's all. <laughs> which I do, do love saying <laughs> has finally lowered the boom on Facebook. We covered this pending and growing issue previously, as we noted at the time last December. Russian internet watchdog Roskomnadzor sent notifications to both Twitter and Facebook asking them to provide information about the location of servers that store the personal data of its citizens. And we'll remember that Roskomnadzor, also known as the Federal Service for Supervision in the Sphere of Telecom, Information Technologies, and Mass Communications, certainly it's easier to just to say Roskomnadzor, it's the Russian telecommunications watchdog that runs a huge blacklist of websites banned in Russia. And, of course, back in 2016, LinkedIn was banned. So uh, though the social media platforms, Twitter and Facebook, were given one month to reply back in December, they chose to stick to their guns and to not disclose this information. As a result, Moscow's uh, Tagansky District Court imposed a whopping 3,000 rubles fine. <laughs> How much is that? <laughs> on Twitter last week and the same on Facebook today. What is 3,000 rubles in like U.S. dollars? Yeah. Yes. Brace yourself. It is. $47. <laughs> Oh, yep. Yikes. That's uh, what are they going to do? If, I, I don't know if uh, if uh, Mark fills his tank or if he charges his battery, but uh, less than a tank full of gas these days. Uh, that fine turns out was the minimum that Russian courts could impose on companies for violating Article 19.1 of the Administrative Code of the Russian Federation. Failure to provide information. The maximum amount of the fine under this article is a whopping 5,000 rubles or $78. <laughs> so they probably weren't too concerned either way. They didn't even throw the book at them. That's what's funny. Now, <laughs> Twitter and Facebook are not off the hook. However, since Russia law does give them the ability or – well, to to completely ban non-complying social media companies as they banned LinkedIn back in 2016. So we'll see what happens. Of course, Telegram, we, we covered that fiasco with, you know, all of the blocking and, and, and other problems in AWS blocks got blocked, causing all kinds of other sites to get blocked. And it was a mess. So. We'll see how this goes. Uh, it will be interesting to see because, you know, we're, 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 again, watching the evolution in so many different directions of, of what the Internet means to the world. Um, Kaspersky Lab named the massive APT framework suite Taj Mahal because the stolen data – was transferred to the attacker's command and control server in an XML file named Taj Mahal. They described this as a state-of-the-art, 
high-tech, modular-based malware toolkit that not only supports a vast number of malicious plugins. For, and it's funny because, I mean, I looked – if you if you click on that link uh, on the show notes, Leo, for the it's uh, securelist.com at the beginning of the Taj Mahal article, they have a they enumerate the 80 modules that are contained in this thing, and it is a little chilling to think. And the reason I wanted to share this with our listeners is just to get a to get a sense for the the just the the practical reality of the kind of instrumentation which exists now on the internet. Um, okay, so they describe this as a state-of-the-art, high-tech, modular-based malware toolkit that not only supports a vast number of malicious plugins for distinct espionage operations, but also comprises never-before-seen and obscure tricks. So they're learning things Kaspersky is from from what they see happening out in the world. Evidence shows that the system has been in operation for at least five years, but and they only discover it in the autumn of 2018, so late last year. And so, so that also suggests that you know who knows how many other similar systems are in use now, and. How, for for how long they will be, for how long they have been or will be until they're discovered. Because here's one that made it for five years. Um, malware samples that they examined suggest that the, that, that the cyber espionage group behind this attack has been active since at least August of 2014. Um, the system pinged Kaspersky's radar late last year. Uh, when the attackers used it to spy on the computers of a diplomatic organization belonging to a Central Asian country whose nationality and location have not been disclosed. So presumably they were under some sort of Kaspersky system protection and Kaspersky's um, you know, intruder detection system said, whoops, what's this? They wrote, Kaspersky wrote, Taj Mahal, is a previously unknown and technically sophisticated APT, we know that's Advanced Persistent Threat Framework, discovered by Kaspersky Lab in the autumn of 2018. This full-blown spying network consists of two packages named Tokyo and Yokohama. It includes backdoors, loaders, orchestrators, C2 communicators, audio recorders, key loggers, screen and webcam grabbers, documents and cryptography key stealers, and even its own file indexer for the victim's machine. They wrote, we discovered up to 80 malicious modules stored in its encrypted virtual file system. So it even, it installs its own file system an encrypted virtual file system within the victim file system. Um, and they said this was one of the highest numbers of plugins we've ever seen for an APT tool set. Um, they said just to highlight its capabilities, Taj Mahal is able to steal data from a CD burnt by a victim as well as from the printer queue. It can also request to steal a particular file from a previously seen USB stick next time the USB is connected to the computer. The file will be stolen. Taj Mahal, they said, has been developed and used for at least the past five years. The first known legit sample timestamp is from August 2013. And the last one is from April 2018. The first confirmed date when Taj Mahal samples were seen on a victim's machine is August of 2014. And I have a picture in the show notes that shows uh, that, that, that sort of depicts this. The, the first box, extensive mod modular APT framework. 
initial attacks and infection methods unknown. Then the Stage 1 Tokyo package consists of three modules with, uh, with backdoors, a PowerShell shell script, contacts the command and control server, and remains in the victim as backup. That then, in turn, loads stage two, which is, which is the Yokohama package, consisting of up, to 80, of up to 80 modules, installing an encrypted file system within the target system, con and it, containing plugins, libraries, configuration files, and more. It's able to hunt for documents, visual and audio files, website cookies, and Apple backup lists. It can also take into it can take info from the printer queue, burned CDs, and previously installed USB sticks. Stolen data is sent to the command and control in an XML file called Taj Mahal, and thus the name of this thing. So Kaspersky concluded their report saying that the Taj Mahal framework is an intriguing discovery that's of great interest, not the least for its high level of technical sophistication, which is beyond any doubt. They said the huge amount of plugins that implement a number of features is something we have never seen before in any other APT activity. For example, it has its own indexer, emergency command and controls, is capable of stealing specific files from external drives when they become available, and so on. The question is, why go to all that trouble for just one victim, they ask. They say a likely hypothesis is that there are other victims we haven't found yet. This theory is reinforced by the fact that we couldn't see how one of the files in the VFS, that's the virtual file system, was used by the malware, opening the door to the possibility of additional versions of the malware that have yet to be detected. So anyway, I just, I wanted to just sort of update everybody on, you know, you know, this is cyber warfare. This is nation state scale um, advanced per persistent penetration, targeted attacks. It, 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 it installs itself in a system, sets up shop, and is incredibly capable. I mean, it's, it's like having an agent of the attacker sitting there, you know, in the machine watching it do things. It can be, it, once the, the, the remote attackers figure out what's going on, what this computer is doing, who it belongs to, what kind of things it's likely to see. They're able to, to, to essentially set up triggers which will be triggered when specific files and events occur, causing it to spring to life, grab those things, and then send them back to the mothership. So, I, I mean, again... At the beginning of this podcast, back on on the, on the single digit episodes, this would have seemed like sci-fi. Sci it's just like, oh, really? Come on! And now it's just like, oh yeah, we're just updating everybody on on what's happening out there. Wow. Um, I uh, I want a little bit of miscellany. I wanted to uh, just mention for Firefox users a a handy add-on that I started to use for the first time yesterday. Um, it's called Auto Tab Discard. Uh, for those of us who like to run with lots of tabs, one of the things that I've noticed is that restarting Firefox dramatically drops the amount of memory it's using because as you go to tabs, the the, the like you know bring up a web page today's web pages are becoming huge there in some cases i'll see that you block origin will have blocked 50 50 things from some web page and even with it in place that this page is is multiple megabytes of stuff that it has loaded 
The point is when you switch away from that tab, that page remains in memory. And so as you are like doing research, pursuing links, clicking things, kind of building up a, a, a list of stuff you want to get back to, which is why my tabs tend to accumulate. Uh, so does memory. Um, if, and so what I, what I, what I had been doing in the past was just closing Firefox and then reopening it and Firefox would reload the tabs, but not their contents, not until I brought them to the foreground. Well, Auto tab discard does that for me. You can set it up. Uh, it's tunable, so it can do it for you continuously in the background. Uh, what I do is because it also has an appearance on the toolbar. Uh, I just have it set so that when I click the, the it, its toolbar, it'll flush all the memory used for all of the non-current tabs. Uh, and 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 I've just watched my my memory consumption dropped, for example, by four gig, uh, which is you know, just shocking to me to say, uh, but that's the case. So I just wanted to mention auto tab discard is the name. And if anybody else is a Firefox user and a heavy user of tabs where you, you le where you have over the course of a session, you visit many different pages, um, uh, you may want to consider it. Uh, and it can also be set up to like, not do this until it begins to run, your system begins to run short of memory or some number of tabs have been left open and so forth. So uh, all kinds of settings. Um, a, uh, a listener of ours, Andy Weaver in Bath, UK, uh, with the subject of Spinrite, he said, really enjoy security now. The subject coverage is always interesting and just the right level of technical detail for my level of tech knowledge. So I'm glad for that, Andy. He said, wondering about the long awaited spin right update. If I buy now, will I be entitled to the promised update features when released? And he says, many thanks, live long and prosper. Uh, and so I just wanted to mention, yes, absolutely. Not only you, but somebody who bought Spinrite 6 15 years ago in 2004 will also be entitled for free to a to what I do to it moving forward uh, through the 6 series. Uh, 6.1 will, as I've been saying, uh, be, I already know how much faster it will be because I was benchmarking an early version of it before I paused. Well, it's... Okay, stopped <laughs> working on it in order to do Squirrel. Um, I have had people upset with me for taking this long, but when they've had the when they've seen what Squirrel does and how it works, uh, they've actually forgiven me. So maybe uh, other people who are uh, impatient waiting for me to get back to Spinrite will also understand why I felt why I felt that I just had to get this thing Squirrel. Uh, out to the world uh, before I got back to Spinrite. And in return, everybody, I mean, even people who bought Spinrite a long time ago will be getting a, a much enhanced product for free. So yes, anybody who has any version of Spinrite 6 will be able, will get all of the updates at no charge. And a little beyond that, another benefit for already owning it is, as I have said recently, um, I'm going to make the the functional pre-release versions available to anybody who has Spinrite 6. Um, and I also think I, I'm going to discuss this with, with my team, um, but we're already considering no longer uh, no longer offering pre-version 6 upgrades at that point because Spinrite 6 will be 15 years old. And I think that's long enough, especially when the, the point 0.1 release and on are going to be so radically different from what Spinrite 6 had ever been before. So I'm happy to make them all available to owners of Spinrite 6, but I don't think <coughs> we will uh, continue to update or upgrade people from beyond 15 years ago. I think that seems more than fair. Um, a bit of closing the loop with our listeners. Uh, Roy in Israel 
says, another reason to use a password manager or squirrel, he says. Hi, Steve. I've been listening to the show for a few months now. I found this out when one of our support engineers opened a bug about the ability to retrieve the password in our service login page using a simple inspect and replace type method within Chrome. He says, of course, there was nothing we can do about it, but I wanted to share this anyway so people understand how dangerous is the simple password manager which is embedded within our browser. And he gives a link to maketecheasier.com slash C password in browser. He says, thanks for a great show, Roy. And I, that brought actually brought to mind something I did with Lori a couple months ago. Th there was some site that she needed to provide her, she needed to know her password for, which Chrome knew. And so with her watching, I dug, I drilled into the, just the standard Chrome options and clicked a few times and got to my Chrome's memorized password list and brought up the password and showed it. And she, her eyes just like went wide open. The fact that all the passwords which she had had Chrome memorized for her were right there to anyone free for the taking. Anybody who was sitting in front of her computer. So she said, what? And I said, oh, yeah, that's, you know, it's convenient to have your browser do that for you. But uh, if you do that, anybody who can access your computer can have all the passwords of all of your accounts. They that, need your login, obviously. Uh, it's not. Yeah. 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 They have to log in. They can't just. Yeah. Who, if they have access to your computer, then right, they, right. they have access to, to everything in your browser. Um, uh Okay, so also, for just, so just a reminder to our listeners, Scott in Boston, he says, security now feedback, uBlock origin disables ping attribute by default. Oh, this is how I learned of it. Uh, he said, hi, Steve, per your story last week on the formalization of the ping attribute in the HTML spec, it looks like uBlock origin already blocks sending that info. He says, it's in the settings tab under privacy as disable hyperlink auditing and he says in, in, in the on the tab it reads checking this will prevent hyperlink auditing hyperlink auditing is best summarized as phone home feature or more accurately phone anywhere meant to inform one or more servers of where links you click or of which links you click on and when um he says the explanatory link goes to a page that defines hyperlink auditing as encompassing the ping attribute as well as a DOM method called navigator beacon. So he says, I believe both of those are blocked by uBlock origin when disable hyperlink auditing is checked. And uh, I think he said it was done by default. I have to check mine to see if it's on by default. But thank you, Scott, for the heads up and another Nice benefit of uBlock Origin. Richard in York, UK, he says, I've been listening to Security Now for a few years and absolutely love it. More than that, it's been super useful as well. But in 709, meaning last week, you <laughs> have revolutionized my working on Windows. He says, I am forever needing to type in slash copy file paths for various things, and I can hardly believe that copy as path has always been there, and I didn't know about it. Thank you so much for letting the world know about that. It seems like a very little thing, but it is so incredibly quick and useful. And then he says in asterisks, mind blown. Uh, and Leo, since you missed it, I never knew that when you right click on something in windows to get the, the list of like, you know, the properties list of, of things you can do. If you shift right click, the right click menu gets additional things. One of which is, um, co uh, copy as path, which allows you to get, to put the entire file system path onto the clipboard 
for subsequent pasting somewhere else. Very I, handy. I, I, That's nice. Yeah, yeah, I explained to our listeners that um, that I used to use in XP uh, uh, a, a, an add-on um, uh, uh, send to clipboard as it was called, and that I missed it because I hadn't yet in, uh, added that to Windows 7, and that it turns out it was there all along. Oh, and I also saw from some other listeners that there are additional things you get in other places when you shift right click, um, like the so, oh the send to option under there is also gets a whole bunch more things. Actually, it almost like doubles its size. You get just a gazillion folders and shortcuts that that send to can send things to. So uh, additional things to explore with shift right click. So thank you everybody for that. Uh, oh, and that was the that was the next tip I had from an anonymous sender who mentioned that the send to menu is also dramatically uh, enhanced. And so, Leo, we'll take our last break and then discuss dragon blood. Mm. Uh, they have drawn blood <laughs> from the WPA3 spec. Just in time for the Game of Thrones. Our show oh. today, thank you, Steve, is brought to you uh, by the same folks who bring you Steve's personal website, my blog at leolaporte.com, and some of the biggest publications in the world, WordPress. In fact, one-third of all the Internet is powered by WordPress. I, uh, I started with WordPress right at the very beginning when Matt Mullenweg published it uh, for the first time. I had a server lying around. <laughs> I installed it, uh, and man, it, it was awesome, except I found I spent a lot of time tweaking it, configuring it, patching it. <laughs> After a while... Uh, that got a little tiresome. I thought, I really had to spend more time blogging. That's when I found WordPress.com. It's now been 12 years, almost 13, since I started using WordPress.com. Fantastic place to host your website. You don't have to be a geek to use WordPress. You don't have to be a CSS or HTML guru or anything like that. And what's nice is uh, they keep it secure. They patch it. But they are the experts. They give you hundreds of templates to choose from so you can make a site that looks every bit your site, but without a lot of complicated coding. They do all the hosting. They do all the tweaking, all the security patches. You get to do what you started a website for, publish. Whether you're an individual or a business, I'm going to make a case for both, especially if you're a teenager. I think teenagers go, well, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat. What do I need WordPress for? But the problem with that is if, if people Google your name, what do they find? You go ahead, kids, Google your name. See, if you don't have a website, maybe they'll find those social posts. Maybe they'll be able to see them. But more likely, they're going to find somebody else's post about you. You want to control your own reputation. This is part of growing up these days is building a site that reflects you. And it's doubly true for a business. Businesses, if you don't have a website, it's like not having a phone or something. I mean, it's, it's part of the modern way of doing business. And, of course, no matter what you need, WordPress can handle it. You start... With a simple site that's free, you have room to grow. You know, as time has gone by, I've upgraded, upgraded. Now I have the full business account, and that gives me all sorts of great plugins I can use. WordPress has everything you need to make the best site ever. That's why companies like Fortune.com and Quartz are using WordPress as their engine, as their back end. WordPress doesn't have any two-week trials, no hidden fees. You, you just go and use it. You'd be going today. And if you're a kid or you're having a kid or you have a kid and you want to set something up, what a great idea to set up a WordPress site, register their name as a domain, and when they get, you know, to 13 or 14, maybe 15, whatever you think is appropriate, say, hey, look, this is your site. Here's the keys, kid. Go have fun. It's the best thing you could do for a kid. WordPress.com. It's built to grow with you, to get you where you want to be tomorrow. And, yeah, they do e-commerce. They do everything. Customer support is the best. It's not just page turners uh, reading a notebook. It's actual WordPress users, WordPress experts. And they're there 24-7, even on weekends. So you can get the support you need, the help you need. I've used them many times, and they're wonderful. They're friendly, they're nice, and they're smart. The WordPress platform is powerful, flexible. Some of the best companies, the biggest companies use it. You should use it. One-third of the Internet uses it. Millions of people use WordPress.com every day to turn their dreams into reality. You want to try it? 
It's simple enough. I've got 15% off any new plan purchase at wordpress.com slash security now. Wordpress.com slash security now. Uh, that's how you let them know you heard it here on Security Now. That helps us. And it's how you get 15% off. WordPress.com slash security now. Go visit my site, leolaporte.com or Steve's site. What is your what is your WordPress site? Is it stevegibson.com? Blog.grc.com. Oh, okay. So you yeah. could host it with your own, you know, you have whatever IIS running and everything. But it's just Actually, the, I, have, I, I have moved to my own server. Oh, you have? Okay. Yep. Why yeah. is that? Uh, just because I could. Why not? You've got one. Yeah. Running yeah. out of your basement. <laughs> if you had a basement. Actually, it's probably right behind you somewhere. And that pile over there. It's uh, over in Tuss <laughs> It's over. It's it's like behind lots of security over at level three. So. Ah, yeah. yeah. See, this is exactly what I used to do. That's why I went to WordPress.com. I don't want to do that. All right, on we go with the show. So level uh, level three WPA three uh, is still suffering from being closed. Uh, and, you know, as I said at the top of the show, I, I just it's it's so critical that something that is as mission critical as Wi-Fi be secure. And the idea that security researchers and academics are unable to to examine the protocol while it's in development is unconscionable. Yeah. And. And these guys say as much, having just found a bunch of problems with it. Um, so WPA3 is, as it begins to roll out, the actual devices are becoming available. And so in service, the research are, are beginning to play with it. Uh, and faults are arising. So they didn't Matthew, get the code from the Wi-Fi Alliance. No, they they had to no get help. a device. Oh, yep. Boy. Reverse engineer no it, hack it. Yep. And then tell yep. them, guys, you did it wrong again. Yep. So Matthew Van Hoof, a researcher who was at the University of Leuven, KU Leuven, two years ago, where he discovered and revealed a severe flaw in Wi-Fi protected access to uh, which is what we're all still using today, he named that attack Crack, K-R-A-C-K, oh, yeah. for the key reinstallation attack. So today he's now at the New York University Abu Dhabi and working with another researcher at Tel Aviv University and also KU Leuven. Their new research paper is titled Dragon Blood, a Security Analysis of WPA3's SAE handshake. SAE stands for Simultaneous Authentication of Equals. Anyway, uh, we've mentioned here in our preliminary discussion of WPA3, that's all we've been able to have because I can't get my hands on a spec uh, in order to comment on it or even describe it to our listeners. Um, you know, eventually it'll leak out despite their best efforts because this is the Internet and somebody will, you know, re republish the PDF of the spec. So, you know, someday. Uh, anyway, so uh, <coughs> WPA3 personal is the protocol which replaces WPA2's pre-shared key, the PSK, pre-shared key uh, with that protocol the simultaneous authentication of equals. It's intended to provide more robust password-based authentication. So th th that would be the protocol we would use in our homes, for example, where, where we, would, we would come up with a password for our Wi-Fi and then give it to our, all of our devices. But instead of using the pre-shared key protocol that we have today in WPA2, we'd be using this SAE, the simultaneous authentication of equals protocol, but in the but no users would be wouldn't even know that they would still be having like oh what's my Wi-Fi password so our interface to it would would look the same. Um, that protocol SAE is known as Dragonfly, and it appears to contain as these guys have found a number and this is what they said 
of fundamental design flaws, which expose users to password partitioning attacks. In their abstract, it was about a 16-page technical paper, and since I have no access to the spec, I, I have excerpted sort of the key pieces of this to give us, our listeners, a, a sense for what they have done and what they found. So in their abstract, they said, the WPA3 certification, and th that word is important because it turns out it's a certification. The a WPA3 certification aims to secure Wi-Fi networks and provides several advantages over its predecessor, WPA2. And they do agree with that. They, they agree this is better than what we had before. Unfortunately, it could have been better still had anybody, well, anyway, I'll, I'll stop beating that horse, such as protection against offline dictionary attacks and forward secrecy. Yay for that. Unfortunately, they write, we show that WPA3 is affected by several design flaws and analyze these flaws both theoretically and practically. Most prominently, we show that WPA3's simultaneous authentication of equals handshake, commonly known as Dragonfly, is affected by password partitioning attacks. These attacks resemble dictionary attacks and allow an adversary to recover the password by abusing timing or cache-based side channel leaks. Our side channel attacks target the protocol's password encoding method. For instance, our cache-based attack exploits SAE's hash-to-curve algorithm. The resulting attacks are efficient and low cost, brute forcing all eight character lowercase passwords. Okay, listen to that. Brute forcing all eight character lowercase passwords requires less than $125 in Amazon EC2 instances. In light of ongoing standardization efforts on hash to curve, Password authenticated key exchanges, so called PAKEs, that's password authenticated key exchanges, and Dragonfly as a TLS handshake. Our findings are also of more general interest, that is to say, just you know, beyond the its particular use in WPA3. They said finally, we discuss how to mitigate our attacks in backwards compatible manner and explain how minor changes to the protocol could have prevented most of our attacks. In their introduction, they said, the Wi-Fi Alliance recently announced WPA3 as the more secure successor to WPA2. Unfortunately, this is them writing, it was created without public review, meaning experts could not critique any of WPA3's new features before they were released. Moreover, although the new handshake of WPA3 was designed in an open manner, its security guarantees are unclear. On one hand, there is a security proof of a, close, of a close variant of WPA3's handshake. But on the other hand, another close variant of the, of the handshake received significant criticism during its standardization. These issues raise the question whether WPA3 is secure in practice. We remark that WPA3 does not define new protocols but instead mandates which existing protocols a device must support. This means WPA3 is not a specification, but a certification. Put differently, devices can now become WPA3 certified, which assures they implement certain protocols in an interoperable manner. The only novelty of the WPA3 or certification is a transition mode where 
WPA2 and WPA3 are simultaneously supported for backward compatibility with WPA2. Although WPA3 follows recommended practice by existing standards, we believe more openness to alternate to alternate protocols could have increased its security. In this paper, we perform a security analysis of WPA3's simultaneous authentication of equals handshake. This handshake was designed to prevent dictionary attacks and continues the biggest and constitutes, sorry, the biggest improvement over WPA2. We systematically analyzed its security by reading specifications, inspecting formal proofs, and auditing open source implementations. This analysis revealed several design and implementation flaws. For instance, when verifying the assumptions made by the formal proof of the SAE handshake, we discovered both timing and cache-based side channel vulnerabilities in its password encoding method. We empirically confirmed all our findings against both open source and recently released proprietary implementations of WP of WPA3. Exactly as you said, Leo, once they had some hardware in their hands, they verified that these problems survived certification. They said, all combined, our work resulted in the following contributions, and there are six. They said, we provide a self-contained and high-level description of WPA3 and its SAE handshake. So basically, they have provided what, what unfortunately the Wi-Fi Alliance has refused to provide. They said, we, as a consequence of lots of research and reverse engineering and comparing, um, you know, if in the field implementations, some, op some early open source implementations of the spec and so forth. They said, we show, the second contribution, that the anti-clogging mechanisms of SAE is unable to prevent denial of service attacks, in particular by abusing the overhead of SAE's defense against already known side channels, a resource-constrained device can overload the CPU of a professional access point, meaning something so a something like an, an infected IoT device could perform a, a denial of service that would bring down uh, the the a strong CPU of a of a high performance access point running WPA3. Third contribution, we present a dictionary attack against WPA3 when it is operating in transition mode. This is accomplished by trying to downgrade clients to WPA2. Although WPA2's four-way handshake detects the downgrade and aborts, the frames sent during the partial four-way handshake provide enough information for a dictionary attack. In other words, th this, this, this transition mode which is new to WPA3, was not properly designed. Um, they said, we also present a downgrade attack against SAE and discuss implementation-specific downgrade attacks when a client improperly auto-connects to a previously used WPA3-only network. Fourth, we empirically investigate the feasibility of timing attacks against WPA3's SAE handshake. This confirms timing attacks are possible and leak info about the password. Five, we present a novel microarchitectural cache-based side channel attack against the SAE handshake. This attack leaks information about the password being used. Our attack even works against hash-to-curve algorithm implementations that include countermeasures against side-channel attacks. This type of attack against hash-to-curve algorithms is of independent interest due to current standardization efforts surrounding hash-to-curve methods. And finally, sixth, we show 
both theoretically and empirically, how the recovered timing and cache info can be used to perform an offline password partitioning attack. This enables an adversary to recover the password used by the victim. So I had here also in the show notes the conclusions and recommendations, but most of it is a rehash in, in other words of what I already said. Um, so uh, they worked, that they basically tore WPA3 apart uh, and implemented a practical offline attack on WPA3's personal equivalent, that is the SAE, the um, Simultaneous Authentication of Equals protocol, which will be used by all of us in our homes once WPA3 happens. Um, they worked responsibly with the Wi-Fi Alliance, who then, and the Wi-Fi Alliance, who then, of course, uh, issued the security update April 2019 in a CYA fashion. Uh, they said, the Wi-Fi Alliance wrote, as with any technology, the robust security research necessary to remain ahead of emerging threats will occasionally uncover new vulnerabilities. Security researchers identified vulnerabilities in a limited number of early implementations of WPA3 personal and immediately brought their discovery to the Wi-Fi industry. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, because, of course, the Wi-Fi industry, that is, these guys, didn't make any of this available to these researchers earlier. They had to wait for it to be available. There is no evidence, writes the Wi-Fi Alliance, of the vulnerability being used against Wi-Fi users maliciously. Yeah, because no one has this yet, fortunately. And... Wi-Fi Alliance has taken immediate steps to ensure users can count on WPA3 personal to deliver even stronger security protections. They have two bullet points. Wi-Fi certified in all caps, which has got a trademark on it, WPA3 personal now includes additional testing within our global certification lab network to encourage greater adoption of recommended practices. Yeah, meaning that translation is they've, they've gone whoops and figured out that they need to fix the existing devices against these things that these guys found. And Wi-Fi Alliance is broadly communicating details on these vulnerabilities and implementation guidance to device vendors as the industry begins to bring WPA3 personal to market. They write, these issues can be resolved through a straightforward software update, a process much like the software updates Wi-Fi users regularly perform on their mobile devices. W3A3, WPA3 personal is in the early stages of deployment and the small number of device manufacturers that are affected have already started to deploy patches to resolve this issue. In other words, we didn't offer it to researchers early enough, so devices are already in the field, which are broken, and now need to be patched. So, whoops, we're doing that. We're making patches available and hoping that people will patch the few devices which are already out there because, as is, they're broken and can have their passwords hacked using this technology, which is now public. They said users can refer to their device vendors' websites for more information. As always, Wi-Fi users should ensure that they have installed the latest recommended updates from device manufacturers. Security is and always will be a dynamic endeavor and Wi-Fi Alliance 
will continue to maintain strong security protections <laughs> for Wi-Fi users through its Wi-Fi certified trademark program. Thank you very much. Uh, our, in other words, y WPA3 will be made secure despite our efforts uh, to keep it hidden as long as possible. After it becomes deployed, it's no longer possible to hide it. So researchers will then be able to have access to what it actually turned out to be, show us where we made mistakes, and hope then that deployed WPA3 instances will someday be updated to close those problems that we created. Thank you very much. And Bravo. That, Leo, <laughs> that, Leo, is our podcast for the week. And once again, all On is right that with the note. world. <laughs> I did say, I, I did forget forget to mention, I should have said it, to, at the end of that conclusions and recommended chunk that I, I removed, uh, they mentioned that several simple changes could have been made. They, they, okay, I, I should say, in light of our presented attacks, yeah. they, they wrote, we believe... The WPA3 does not meet the standards of a modern security protocol. Oh, boy. Whoops. Moreover, we believe that our attacks could have been avoided if the Wi-Fi Alliance created the, W3, the WPA3 specification in a more open manner. Notable is also that, the, that nearly all of our attacks are against SAE protocol encoding method, in other words, against its hash to group and hash to curve algorithm. Interestingly, a simple change to this algorithm would have prevented most of our attacks. In particular, the peer's MAC address can be excluded from the SAE password encoding algorithm and instead included later on in the handshake itself. This allows the password element to be computed offline, meaning an adversary can no longer actively trigger executions of the password encoding method. Essentially, what they're saying is it, it dramatically re, re, uh, reduces the ability to probe an existing system for, 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 for clues which they were able to use. And they said, moreover, this would mean that for a given password, the execution time of the password encoding method would always be identical, limiting the amount of information being leaked. Surprisingly, when the CFRG was reviewing a minor variant of Dragonfly, they actively discussed these types of modifications. However, to our surprise, this change was not incorporated into any of the Dragonfly variants. We also conjecture that resource-constrained devices may not implement all the side-channel countermeasures, as these may be too costly on lightweight, on lightweight processors. Additional, additionally, correcting implement, correct, correctly implementing our suggested backwards-compatible side-channel countermeasures is non-trivial, meaning the, in some sense, the cat is out of the bag, and if anybody was implementing WPA3 in resource-constrained in, in implementations, it may not be practical, as the as the Wi-Fi Alliance said, to fix this through a software update. Mm, wow. They said, yes. They said, this is worrisome because security protocols are normally designed to reduce the chance of implementation vulnerabilities. Right. Finally, they said, we believe that a more open process would have prevented or at least clarified the possibility of downgrade attacks against WPA3 tr transition mode. Nevertheless, although WPA3 has flaws, we still consider it an improvement over WPA2. So eventually we'll get there. Uh, and again, as I've, you know, I said before all this happened that this this idea of developing a protocol this important to the Internet in the dark 
you know, behind closed doors, it's just wrong. And here we're seeing a perfect example of that uh, happening as soon as WPA3 began to creep out into the world. Do you know when they say resource constraint, if they mean CPU or RAM or what? Yeah, they, they must mean um, uh, processing attack. Processing uh, power. Uh, yeah, processing okay. power. Yeah, because so a, I mean, a lot of routers are just, you know, very oh low. Oh, my God. They barely yeah. get off the ground. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, on well, the other hand, uh, light I think, bulbs. Yeah, light bulbs. <laughs> yeah, not even that's routers. true. The 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 WPA three uh, client is needs to be updated too, right? Exactly. Oh, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah I don't expect a lot of a processor in my light bulb. No, I mean the good news is this: they caught this fast, and so let's hope that this thing that this gets fixed. And yeah, I don't know how many you know WPA three devices there even are yeah, so far. Right? I'm aware of none yeah. so far. So maybe they can fix it. Phew. But this is why this process was so broken. You called it. You said this would happen. Yep. You can't develop in secret. You can't, especially an encryption protocol. You just can't do it in secret. That just doesn't work. They should have known by, from WEP, let alone WPA3. From WEP, from WPA1, from WPA, I mean, every single, every one, single one of these one. has been, this has happened, and it has been <laughs> a disaster. Just nuts. Thank you, Wi-Fi Alliance. Well, Steve, uh, once again, we've come to the end of a fabulous episode of Game of Thrones. Uh, we will be back next week with more dragon blood, more fire, and another very uncomfortable seat of swords. Uh, Steve is the uh, man in charge here at GRC.com. That's where you'll find Spinrite, the world's best hard drive recovery and maintenance utility. you also find the show. He's got uh, audio versions of the show and transcripts, very good transcripts uh, do, by Elaine Ferris. So that's a good place to go. Those are That's all free. Everything's free except Spinrite. So buy Spinrite and then use everything else. That's kind of how it works. Uh, you can also leave him questions. He's on the Twitter at SGGRC, uh, and you could go to grc.com slash feedback. There's a form there. There are also great forums if you want to participate in the uh, creation of Squirrel. We're getting close. Yep. GRC.com. Uh, we are at twit.tv, and you'll find audio and video of this show uh, at twit.tv slash SN, or you could subscribe in your favorite podcast application. You'll get a copy of everything the minute it's available. Uh, we will do the next episode, as we always do, on Tuesday, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Thanks uh, so much to Jason Howell for filling in last week, and I'll be back for the foreseeable future. Yay. Yay. Thank you, Steve. Okay, my friend. Talk to you next week for episode 711. 711. Bye. Security now.